So my assignment for the next talk is to uh, talk about innovation in the transcatheter mitral valve uh, field, going to discuss the uh, current state and give a uh, few uh, words about uh, future uh, trends in this particular uh, field. The first thing that actually uh, I want to talk about is about the population that uh, we're trying to target with uh, innovative uh, transcatheter mitral valve technologies. And I like this slide to highlight the current uh, state of the people that actually we get during the screening process. Uh, the paper uh, included um, almost uh, 1,100 patients with uh, 3 plus, 4 plus MR and heart failure between 2000 and 2008. As you can imagine, most of the patients were, were FMR, 74%. And um, the uh, patients on the DMR group, which were the minority, T2 and C, uh, as usually happens, actually underwent surgery, 60% medical therapy. By contrary, the patients with FMR, which actually were the majority, the only minority went for surgery, 36% and 64% uh, went to medical therapy. And the uh, unoperated patients typically had lower ejection fractions and higher STS uh, scores. So this is actually typical and reflects, um, I would actually say, most of the practice worldwide in patients with DMR versus FMR. The reality is the prognosis of an uh, unoperated patients is not very good. And you actually see that at five years, these patients have approximately 50% mortality and 90% of the patients end up hospitalized for uh, heart failure uh, uh, episodes. So the reality is in the real world, MR patients today display complex anatomies, have limited therapeutic options, and are high risk uh, for surgery. As you can actually see, a lot of these patients have MAC, multiple clefts, multiple MR jets, and bioprosthetic uh, valve failures. And technically, these patients, the great majority, are non-surgical and non-tier candidates. So we're not really talking about here, 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 about truly the patient that could benefit from surgery, which is without any doubt the standard of care. But the great majority of patients that um, actually are out there with degenerative and functional MR that actually are not good surgical candidates, tier candidates, is still, you know, significant. One of the challenges about uh, innovation in the transcatheter mitral valve uh, field is that the application of the technology is highly driven by the anatomical uh, needs. On one side, you have technologies like mitral tear that require very specific anatomical uh, criteria to be able to be successful. On the other side, you actually have placement technologies that claim to be more agnostic in terms of the anatomy, but it still also have significant anatomical exclusions and, and other actually technologies in between that require specific anatomical uh, defects to be able to be applied, such as transcatheter cordial replacement, leaflet extension, and annular <coughs> reduction being actually kind of in between. So future technology adoption will greatly depend on simplicity, easy of use, for example, the complex use of imaging, and obviously long-term technical uh, performance. Let's, let's talk a little bit about tier limitations and future perspectives. This is without any doubt a technology that is highly standardizable, but not necessarily reproducible. There's no question uh, tier is very simple to perform, achieving very high implantation rates that get close to 100%. But this is highly dependent on the uh, experience of the operators and you see residual mo uh, moderate to severe MR after procedure varies, you know, according to volume. And it's actually reported to be 39% in low volume centers to, you know, less than 15% in high volume centers. Performance actually in complex anatomies is actually a balancing uh, act. In low volume centers, this technology has an excellent safety profile. In high volume centers, it's got an excellent efficacy profile, but it all depends on how aggressive the centers are and how many clips they are actually willing to put. And there is actually a complex balance because the operator sometimes, you know, has to decide whether accepting actually more residual MR or actually putting the patient on mitral stenosis by adding more uh, clips. So the future of tear and other uh, catheter-based repair technologies, in my opinion, depend in developing more imaging-based prediction models of technical success, 
device evolution to allow the use in broader anatomical variations and actually allow reversibility of the procedure, such as cleave removal, to be able to do something else in these particular patients. Moving into actually another technology that actually aims to repair specific pathological conditions. This is an example of that, a half-moon leaflet augmentation device that already achieved 15 uh, patients. This is just a biological proof of concept. And you see that the patient can be deployed and implanted in a, a safe uh, and uh, efficacious way with a significant reduction of MR post-operatively. And this is the type of technologies that will continue to move forward, trying to address a specific pathologies such as, for example, posterior leaflet prolapse or posterior leaflet uh, uh, problems in uh, this case. TMVR um, started uh, entering the field, promising something that actually we didn't have before with our technologies, such as ease of implantation, agnostic to the etiology of MR, reliable elimination of MR, and less recurrence of MR. But I mean, as we move forward, actually, we started to learn about the complexities of this particular technology. One of the first challenges was to actually make the device small. And, and uh, the first generation technologies were around 36 to 40 French in what we call single step technologies. And to be able to reduce the size, uh, technologies actually became multi-step. And that was the, uh, the reason to be able to essentially go this pathway and decrease the French uh, uh, very quickly from, from 40 to actually less than 30 French in actually a matter of uh, years. Right, 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 we have multiple technologies with mul multiple anchoring concepts that I'm not going to expand on, but you can actually see the uh, great uh, uh, variety of technologies with, with different te technological um, approaches and actually concepts as well. But once we started doing these trials, one of the things that I started to realize was the data screen failure rates in TMVR trials related to the anatomical variability in the real world patients. So the concept was very beautiful. We actually had multiple options, thinking about the shape of the annulus, the size of the ventricle, and so forth. But the reality of the real world was we actually encountered significant anatomical abnormalities and variabilities that we were not really used to. So who are these patients rejected from these trials? And we have done a lot of work on that. I tried to understand you know, um, um, why, why these patients are actually so different than the ones that actually we conceived before for, this deep, for these clinical trials. And actually, it turns out there are two actually phenogroups. One group is actually what I call more clinical and, it, and actually the minority. This is where the first generation devices actually fit best. And the most of the exclusions in these patients are clinical. Frailty, life expectancy, large annular area, and afterload mismatch. The second group, which is the most common, is related to primary MR cases, and this is where the first generation devices have significant limitations, mainly anatomical, LVOT obstruction, severe MAC, a small annular area, and septal height. So over the last decade, we actually went over the premise that we were going to go primarily after FMR. And actually, everybody was thinking about that these patients are going to have large ventricle, large annular sizes, non-calcific annuli, and low ejection fractions. Then we ended up with valves with big profiles, with big uh, difficulty to actually go transeptal, low radial force, and diverse uh, methods of anchoring. The resulting challenges right now is LVOT obstruction, percutaneous femoral access, MAC treatment, and myocardial performance in OEF. So one of the issues of the field to move forward so slowly is not the technological aspects of it, but is the mismatch between the clinical need, anatomical need, and devices we have today. But technologies are adapting, and you actually see significant improvement in valve design and delivery system design that I am sure are going to allow more treatment and more inclusion in these patients in the future as all these technological iterations are included. This is a brief summary of all the programs doing right now EFS studies in the US, a summary of the EFS uh, data of the first uh, 30 patients that all the data is being populated. But you actually start to see interesting data as uh, uh, intrepid data, one year mortality of 6.7% and conversion to surgery being very low across the board. All the studies, um, actually all the programs opted to do non-randomized controlled trials, um, that are going to start actually very soon and soon already ongoing. 
have been single arm studies, including around 300 to 400 patients in the primary arms and around 100 patients in the MAC uh, uh, studies. So just to summarize, how can transcatheter mitral valve intervention address the clinical need? The first thing, and I really think this is clear, we need to accept that all these systems, they need to be transeptal or minimally invasive. We need to define the target population and predictor of outcomes to understand which is the patient that benefits from each specific technology. We need to have adaptable device designs to the human pathology and the variability that it presents. Ancillary tools to improve the success rate of transcatheter mitral valve devices. And uh, very important later on is strategies to manage the thrombogenic potential of uh, these devices, especially lethal thrombosis and degeneration. So thank you very much for your